Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to welcome back Dr. Louis Fatui, an author and researcher in Islamic studies and comparative religion. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Paul. Really honored to be invited back on your excellent channel. Thanks. Kind of you. Um, for those who don't remember, uh, Dr. Fatui was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and migrated to the UK in the 1990s. He has a PhD in astronomy from the prestigious Durham University here in England. He came originally from a Christian family, but reversed to Islam in his early 20s. He's published over 25 books in English and Arabic in Islamic studies, and published over 20 research papers in cosmology and applied historical astronomy and on the Islamic calendar. Today, Dr. Fatui has kindly agreed to discuss the prayer of Prophet Joseph upon whom be peace as we read it in the Quran and what this has to teach us about pride, that oldest spiritual disease and its opposite, humility. So over to you, sir. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Again, um, I'm really honored, Paul, uh, to be back on this outstanding and really unique channel and the unique contribution to make um, to educating really the world on Islam and related issues. So thank you, Paul. Thank you for, you know, I'm, I'm really thanking you on behalf of the people I know as well who enjoy your channels and learn a lot from it. Um, just the background um, to what we're talking about, Paul and I, um, you remember, Paul, we first discussed uh, on the back of the previous uh, program where we spoke about differences between the Old Testament and the Quran mm. regarding the story of Joseph, uh, we discussed following up with um, a discussion on a variety of themes uh, in the story of Joseph. And it's a story that it's full of lessons. Mm. Uh, it's full of wisdom. There are gem gems everywhere. Mm. And uh, so we, we were going to discuss a number of those, including uh, the subject uh, of today, which is the concept of pride and humility. Right. And then um, we then concluded that um, probably this subject itself deserves a, a whole discussion, a dedicated discussion. It's mm. very big subject, as we will see theologically, is extremely important. And so we're going to focus on this subject with references uh, forward and backward to the story of uh, Sayyidina Yusuf, uh, Joseph. However, because it's a broader discussion, we're going to obviously talk about these concepts from uh, a, the, a, an Islamic perspective. So um, we're going to look at the Quran. We're going to look at the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, we're going to kind of draw uh, on uh, from uh, our literature and our tradition uh, with respect to these, uh, to these concepts. The importance of pride, uh, the subject of pride, studying pride and humility uh, is not new, of course. Uh, Muslim um, scholars studied mm -hmm. it from the early days. The Prophet Sallallahu dealt with it uh, in his hadith. Uh, in so many episodes uh, throughout his, his, his life. Mm. And the Quran, of course, visits this subject repeatedly, as we will see, and we'll give examples on that throughout. So it is this important, and, uh, and this is really behind the, the decision to, Paul and I, uh, we took to focus on this uh, particular, uh, the whole uh, episode on, on this uh, concept. Mm. Um, what I'm going to do, I, I will be uh, discussing first some basic concepts um, that relate to humility and pride, and then gradually move into more detailed discussion uh, uh, of these concepts. And I'm going to start um, with uh, first uh, looking at a very unique um, prayer in the Quran that is very, very close to my heart personally. All the prayers in the Quran are beautiful, but the story of Joseph is, is extremely beautiful and important. And I, I would like to say this particular prayer, I see that prayer as the heart and the center uh, of, um, of this story. So we're gonna start with this and set the scene for the discussion. 
And um, so I've got some slides and um, uh, on the slides, thank you, Paul. Uh, on the slides, what I've used them mainly for, uh, to, um, to basically for quotations, and I provided uh, where needed um, the uh, Quranic um, surah and, and, and verse, and also hadith, the source of hadith. Uh, so that's just to make it easier for easy reference for viewers. That's the main purpose of it. So the, if we move to the, uh, this, the, I might say a couple of things first about where this occurs. Now, this prayer, occurs at the very end of the story. So this mm. is verse 101. Mm. There are another 10 verses that follow uh, this story. Uh, and then that makes up the 111 verses of the uh, chapter of Joseph. This particular pair is the at the very end after Joseph, uh, that's uh, after Jacob, J Joseph's brother, and his sons uh, had come to Egypt and reunited with Joseph. So he is now praying and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his favor and his grace in bringing all his family and resolving all the issues that, we, that he had with his brothers. So if we can move uh, Paul to the next. Can you do that? Can I? Let me see. Yep, I can. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so what we have here, the story, uh, the prayer starts with, uh, Rabbi, my Lord, uh, you have given me of kingship, so something of sovereignty, uh, and taught me something of the interp interpretation of dreams, that we will ahadith. So what he's doing here, He's starting his prayer by acknowledging first the, the, the kind of favors that Allah had given him, including these two major favors. So he's kind of setting the scene, reminding himself, acknowledging all of that before he goes on and then continues to say, again, addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, creator of the heavens and, the, and earth, you are my guardian in this world and in the hereafter. أنت ولي في الدنيا وفي الآخرة. And then we get to the prayer itself, the kind of uh, the the main part of the prayer that concerns uh, our discussion here, which is that: Cause me to die as a Muslim and join me with the righteous. توفني مسلما وألحقني بالصالحين. This is extremely humble beautiful prayer so let's see what what um uh, sayyidna yusuf is doing here he's already set the scene to say you have made me almost a king he was probably second in command in egypt you have uh, given me a special kind of knowledge that only few individuals were given the wheel al ahadith the interpretation of dreams and of course at this point he was a prophet he is also a prophet. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Joseph is a very long one. By this point, it had been, he'd been close to Allah for decades because we know from the story itself, when his brothers put him in the well to get rid of him, he was a small boy. That's what the Quran tells us. The Old Testament says 17 years old, but in the Quran, he was a small boy. We know from the Quran that when he was put in the bottom of the well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him, spoke to him. You will tell them about what they have done to you while they're unaware or they did not recognize you. So you can see that there is that continuous long relationship, close relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Sayyidina uh, Yusuf. And by by the time he was talking, uh, making this dua, he was a prophet. Now, given all of that, given his history with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cared about him, looked at after him, how many favors he gave him. So look at now, in this context, look at his prayer. 
caused me to die as a Muslim. So this great prophet can't even guarantee that he will die as a Muslim. Hmm. His Islam is a pure and complete and utter surrender hmm. and confession and an acknowledgement that it's all in your hand. Like those favors you give you gave me, which I wouldn't have had had you not given me. I can't be a Muslim by my own, on my own, by my own my own effort. I I ask you to make me die as a Muslim. Can I just can I just clarify one point there, if I may? Sorry to interrupt. Um, course, about the word Muslim, there is it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it not the case that the Arabic literally means one who submits? Um, yeah. And the reason I say that because the word Muslim is associated with the Prophet Muhammad uh, in the modern sense, uh, uh, upon whom be peace. And so people could say, well, how can you say Joseph was a uh, was a Muslim? This was thousands of years ago. But of course, the the Quran the word submission there which you're translating as muslim is has, has a more generic sense of people who submit so in that sense he was a muslim as was abraham as was jesus they all submitted to their creator even the christian gospels today have jesus say thy world to god thy world not mine be done he is submitting to god so in that sense he is a muslim but not in the uh, the more popular sense in today's world where it's associated with the final prophet muhammad sent to mankind would that be fair or Absolutely, Paul. In fact, in fact, there is one particular verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa samakum, I think the word in Muslimin, fi hadha wa min qabl. He called you Muslims in this, meaning the Quran, and before. Mm. So the term Muslim, in whatever form it appeared, in whatever language is before, it clearly is an old term. It, mm. would, it, it would have referred to the same concept, and if you think about it as well, Paul, and you're, of course, you're absolutely right. The, the concept of religion, of course, in the Quran, in Islam, uh, the religion of Allah is one and the same. It hasn't changed. We don't have Old Testament and New Testament. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suddenly changing the way uh, yeah. you establish a relationship. That doesn't exist in Islam. Yeah. And not only that, Islam goes back and says, this has been the case from the days of Adam. When in fact, if you look at it in this way, it's very close to the Old Testament concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because that didn't change. Um, obviously, the concept of the relationship and how to satisfy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, changed uh, after, in particular, with the Christianity, as far as the two, these two Abrahamic uh, religions are concerned. So you're absolutely right. In the Quran, Islam is a general term here. So he's not saying, obviously, he's, you know, he's well before. Uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he's talking about that one religion that he shared with Jacob, with Abraham, with Adam, and later on uh, Moses uh, and um, all other prophets uh, shared. Sayyidina Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam shared with, of course, uh, the prophets before. Okay, thank you. So, so this is um, one particular uh, interesting. Um, kind of observation. Now, then he goes on and he asks to be joined with the righteous. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a little bit of uh, symmetry here. Um, the, uh, the, the symmetry is between Muslim, which is something he's asking to be to happen to him in this world, to, to asking Allah, when I die, um, make me die as a Muslim. And then he's talking about asking something else to happen to him in the hereafter. And that's obviously a uh, response to what he said just before that. You are my guardian in this world and in the year after. Mm. So what do I want from you in this world? Just make sure that I die as a Muslim. Mm. And what do I want from you in the hereafter? Reunite me, join me with the righteous. Al-Hiqni Salihin. And again, look at the humility in that. This mm. is Joseph. So who are the righteous? The righteous are, is a general term in the Quran that basically applies to anybody and everybody who deserves Allah's mercy on the day of judgment. So it's mm -hmm. a generic term. Now, there's a, one particular verse um, I, I, I would like to mention here. 
in which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes those who obey, obey him and obey Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and say, أُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءُ وَالصَّالِحِينَ Those will be with, the, with those, the group that I have um, shown favor to of the prophets, the truthful, the martyrs, and the righteous. The righteous are listed number four in the verse. So here, he's not asking and saying, Tawaffani ma'al anbiya with the Nabiyin. He's not even asking us, and he's a Nabi, he's a prophet. He's not asking and saying, Tawaffani ma'al Siddiqin with the most truthful, even though he was most truthful. In fact, when Pharaoh, I'm sorry, the king, the Egyptian king, sent his uh, servant to Joseph asking for the interpretation of his dream, he started addressing Joseph as Yusuf ayyuha Siddiq. Joseph, O oh, truthful one. Mm. And then um, Muslim scholars had looked at this term, Siddiq, which is a superlative or Sadiq, truthful, but it's a superlative form in Arabic, to mean somebody who is truthful in both word and deed. So it's completely and utterly truthful. So what I'm saying here is that in this prayer, he hasn't even asked to be joined with the prophets mm. or with the uh, uh, Siddiqin, the most he's just listed who as mentioned as the fourth group in, in, in an ayah that talks about all of those. Wow. That's how humble and simple uh, his, his prayer was. Moving on, um, is the is the is the slide looking all right, Paul, there? Yeah, now I can see it. Yeah, Allah is the giver of favor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is really um, a basic concept uh, that I wanted to cover quickly uh, to understand, uh, the again, how they relate to the concept of uh, pride uh, and humility. There are so many verses in the Quran, uh, anybody who's read the Quran uh, would, would know, that confirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of any and every favor. Mm. Um, I'm just quoting one of them, and whatever favor you have is from Allah. One, it basically, any favor uh, you find in your life, in whatever form, it's come from uh, Allah. It's a reminder uh, that uh, everything is from there. In the Surah of Joseph, we have a number of references in which um, Joseph again, as we saw in the prayer, uh, reminds himself and reminds his listeners that any favor he has is from Allah. So when his uh, prison inmates asked him uh, to inter interpret the two dreams for them, he started first by preaching them. In his preaching, he mentioned that the ability to interpret the dreams, he called them, this is a from what my Lord has taught me. Rabbi. And then he goes on to remind them that he was a muwahid. He was somebody who believed in the oneness of Allah as his fathers and forefathers, father and forefathers. And again, here he says, That's from the favor of Allah on us and on people. Now, what's important and what's really significant every time he mentions anything positive about himself, he makes sure that he describes it as a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wouldn't just uh, relate it and mention it. Obviously, it's something that is, uh, that's about him, but he, he's keen on reminding himself, uh, reminding his listeners it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. This language, this language of confession and acknowledgement that every favor is it from Allah, is found in the speech of just about every prophet. When we look in the Quran about what's reported, about all those prophets, you find it everywhere. So let me give you another example. So let's take Prophet uh, Solomon, Sayyidina Sulaiman. And uh, when he found that the throne of Belqis had been brought from uh, Yemen and put uh, in his in his place, he went. He said, 
هذا من فضل ربي هذا من فضل ربي ليشكر لي ليبلوني اشكر ما اكفر this is of the favor of my lord to test me shall i be grateful or shall i be ungrateful mm. and, and this continues this theme of attributing favor to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues uh, throughout and of course our prophet uh, also uh, did that so uh, one day he was with a group of com the companions and then he said none of you would get into paradise because of his good deeds and they uh, and they asked him does this apply to you as well messenger of allah and he goes on even i unless allah bestows his pardon and mercy on me so even i even i the prophet i cannot and I will not, uh, I can earn that only by his mercy. I think this is such a, an important uh, point uh, you're making there. And it's one that's usually not taken on board, particularly by Christians uh, of all people who uh, like to criticize Islam for uh, uh, allegedly teaching that we get to paradise only on our works. And, and clearly here we have even the prophet saying he will not get into paradise because of his good deeds alone. Um, and this is a very a useful thing to take on board and i wish uh, our christian friends would uh, accept that this is the teaching of islam itself uh, and and not perhaps straw man um that their criticisms of of the faith grace and works or uh, is 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 part of islam as well it's not just uh, as, as also the christian view uh, as well that we're, works matter but we are saved by grace yeah yeah i think uh, and, and and obviously there's also kind of significant difference um as you know, Paul, the concept of deed work is far more significant and prominent in Islam than it is actually in Christianity, at least in terms of literature. The way, um, you know, people talk about what you need to do, how often you need to work, but the, the values are similar. But the amount of work required is kind of the, the concept of good deeds appears so... Oh, we have always this term in the Quran, al-Iman wal-Amal al-Salih. Uh, belief or faith and good deeds uh, this kind of this binary combination continues uh, throughout you find it everywhere it's yeah. always there now that and this is very important point because somebody might think okay well it's all down to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what's the point right why do i need to do anything well that's not the point that's not what uh, the quran is a unity as a whole in order to understand any concept concept we need to look at it all as a whole so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in many places, so many uh, verses, that you have to do uh, this, you have not, you must not do that. Uh, and that is what qualifies you for favor. So mm. that's basically you have to prepare, but that favor, it's not, there is no kind of necessary uh, connection between your deeds and your reward. Mm. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I'm going to help you, I'm going to support you, but I want you to do X, Y, Z, uh, live in a particular way, and then I will give you my favors. But work is necessary, and it's not like it's not random, so it's not he's choosing anybody and, okay, I'm going to take you to uh, paradise. It's not mm -hmm. random. So, for instance, in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hal la Do those who know and those who uh, uh, equate or similar to those who don't know of course not so knowledge for instance has has a place in another uh, hadith um, this is very late uh, in the life uh, of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and um, it was uh, uh, obviously uh, in medina and he used to pray a lot um, the prophet used to pray a lot at night and they called Qiyam al layl in Arabic, so night worship. And it got to the point where at times his feet would, would swell. And uh, people close to him tried to kind of, obviously feeling for him, say, why do you do that? So um, th he was asked once, uh, why do you do that, given that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already forgiven for you, forgiven you your, your sins, those that you've, 
committed and those yet to come. So why do you do that? And his answer was, Should I not then be a grateful servant? It's incredible this kind of sense of humility, acknowledgement mm -hmm. of awareness of, of the favor and the connection of that favor to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuous, even at that point where effectively, in theory, he could live the way he wanted, if you like, and not necessarily worship that much. He still said, shouldn't I then be grateful? And there is uh, an, another kind of, I think I've got the text here for those who want it. Yeah, here we go. So that's what he was asked. Allah has forgiven you your sins of the past and those to follow. And then that's his reply. Should I then uh, not be uh, grateful? Mm. And a couple of things to mention here worth uh, maybe noting is a side point, really. When I quoted Sulaiman earlier, mm. he said, um, uh, this is uh, from an of uh, the uh, favor of from from my lord to test me whether i will uh, be grateful or ungrateful now the word for ungrateful akfur akfur now we all know the term kuf kuf usually uh, is taken to mean disbelief mm. disbelief now kufr, kufr is more of a kind of general Arabic term and what it means is concealing something and not acknowledging it so mm. don't acknowledge something and that is extends to mean reject something mm. so kufr in the context of rejecting faith becomes the the kufr that we all talk about disbelief in the cons in the context of rejecting the oneness of Allah it becomes ishrak shirk so associating with Allah others in the context of rejecting uh, the existence of Allah is atheism ilhad and in the context of of our context is also called kuf kuf means to be ungrateful mm -hmm. to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. okay so if we move uh, now i think to the next slide yeah, yeah. now this is where uh, 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 this is one verse I want to talk about, and I've because it's really a, a quite an extraordinary verse, and obviously um, in Islam, uh, the Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't kind of intervene at one point in the world and then uh, stand aside, and then at some point he comes back and then stands aside. The Allah Subhanahu wa Taala runs the affairs of this world the creation the universe continuously so the point here if you have a favor if your health is good right now and if it was good yesterday and it will be inshallah good tomorrow this this only be maintained by the continue continue continuous support and favor of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why he says something like, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا And if you count the favors of Allah, you won't be able to count them. Now, the verse that I'm going to mention, I uh, would like to quote here, is this. This comes from Surah Al-Isra. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addressing the Prophet sallallahu We read this verse a lot, but we don't really, I think, most of the time, Stop at it and think of what it's actually telling us and how incredible and unusual it is. So he's telling him, uh, and if we willed, we could surely do away with that which we revealed to you. That's the Quran. Then you would not find for yourself concerning it any advocate against us. I can remove it all, withdraw it, take it back, and you won't find anybody who would be able to support you, help you, to reclaim it, to recover it. It would be gone. When this verse was first revealed, um, we read in the books of history, um, some of the Muslims, early Muslims, kind of started discussing, well, what, the, what does that mean? 
So one of them uh, told Ibn Mas'ud, well, I've, I've got the Quran written down. I have written quite a bit. What would happen to that? And he replied and he told them, it would all disappear. It would all go away. No trace of it uh, would, would be left. Now, the time of the revelation of this verse is about year 11, 12, uh, the end of the Meccan, Meccan period, because it's the Surah of Isra. By then, most of the Meccan Quran had been revealed. And there was a history of, like I say, 11, 12 years of Islam, of the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu This is an extraordinary kind of warning. And what it is telling us and what it is saying to the Prophet, because he did not withdraw the Quran, of course, so it was only uh, like, a, it, it can only be a lesson. He's trying to tell us something. I can do that, but I did not do it. And if this is how he addressed the Prophet Sallallahu and a unique, special, miraculous favor like the Quran, so how cautious and careful we have to have to be in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expectations. So he goes on to complete this kind of uncommon. And why did he not withdraw uh, the Quran? Except as a mercy from your Lord. Mm. Indeed, this favor upon you has ever been uh, great. Now, What's interesting here, of course, is that the use of the word, the use of the word mercy, because, of course, we know that the Prophet ﷺ is described as rahmatan lil alameen, a mercy for all the people. So it's kind of in, in a subtle, indirect way, references the fact that the Prophet ﷺ uh, is rahmatan lil alameen, mercy to all people. And then it goes on and again uses the word uh, favor here, that فضل, فضل الله كان عليك كبيرا and again it calls it فضل. There is no mention of any entitlement here. The focus, now the Prophet Sallallahu of course was chosen to be the Prophet, but the, the focus of the verse is completely on Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, His favor and the fact that He could actually withdraw this, this really unique and kind of um, universal uh, miracle, mercy, and change the uh, direction of history uh, altogether. And the question here, or the lesson here, if a prophet cannot, Prophet Muhammad cannot be guaranteed the Quran and the mission and his history, can we really feel safe and guaranteed anything we have? And the only thing that you remind, we have to remind them ourselves is that it's there because he is there and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it to be there. Whatever that favor, whatever that uh, special thing uh, we happen to have. Hmm. Now, in those three slides, what I wanted to show is the subject of the, the importance of humility. And humility here in the context of attributing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything good that happens to us and reminding ourselves and others that this is always the case. But of course, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, 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 when, when we, humility itself is an obligation. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, com commanded us. Uh, and, and explicitly also, not only in these kind of indirect references in terms of our relationship with him. And I would like to mention here, for instance, uh, one particular verse, and it says, And the servants of the most merciful are those who walk on the earth in humility. And when the ignorant address them, they, say, they answer, peace as in they don't get involved in disputes and so in humility and they don't um they, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it doesn't you know it's not saying here uh, don't discuss things with people he's talking about the ignorant meaning those who don't want to learn who don't want to actually 
develop and they have no interest in the in the truth and uh, part of that humility is not to engage in that kind of i want to prove you wrong and i want to show yeah. you and i want x x x y z because they're not interested in self-promotion here they are looking at somebody who they don't believe is interested in the truth they have nothing to do with them well you have your deen you have your own religion i have mine and they live in 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 humility it's such a a, a, a timely uh, reminder of this particular uh, verse because uh, so many of us if we're involved in dawah or so on um it, it can be provoked uh, our egos kick in and um uh, and and we can not uh, answer peace but we can answer with harsh words or anger or um you know retribution i mean we've seen many bad examples uh, in certain places uh, even at speaker's corner um but no this is good to be reminded of this first to be honest i think people who are particularly active on social media with a lot yep. of following like yourself yep. paul i can't even imagine what that's like frankly so um it, it's very challenging and i'm pretty sure it kind of test tests you every day but you're absolutely right it's a reminder how we should behave act in this way it's very easy to be dragged into something very. because some people can be very persistent of course yeah uh, i mean i've seen some at times you know when we do programs or i look at some of the comments at times and um <laughs> And what can you do? I mean, you look at the comments and say, that is the, the ayah that describes them. Salam, peace, and walk away. Yeah. You don't it's, engage with them. A quite, a quite a gendered issue as well. Um, if, if speaker's corner, but not just there, online as well. It's overwhelmingly a male preserve. M uh, guys are involved in it. And I think that many women are put off by the combative, aggressive uh, atmosphere and ethos of what goes on. Uh, and many women prefer more cooperative, uh, more interpersonal, you know, looking for consensus and bringing people in. Um, so it, it, actually, it's not just everyone. It's particularly a, a gendered issue, uh, curiously. But uh, men are particular at fault here, I think, uh, uh, for, for, for not following this uh, reminder in the Quran. Yeah, I completely, completely agree with you. And I think I would also generalize what you've just said, Paul. It's, um, I'm, I'm a man and I know about male aggression. And mm -hmm. I can, you know, speak, nobody can say, well, you're, um, you know, anti-men or something like that. But the reality is that we, as, you know, uh, uh, males have more aggression, yeah. surely. Than, and that shows even in these areas. And it's not only when it comes to religious discussions. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, I have experience at work, university, etc. You see it in all walks of life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that aggression obviously comes out more, even more so when there are some emotive kind of subjects like religion. Yeah. And um, you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay. Um, there's another verse I might um, mention. It's not really uh, on the slide. Uh, this is Luqman, the wise man, Luqman, uh, preaching to his son. And he says, وَلَا تُصَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ And do not turn your cheek in contempt to people. وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحًا And don't walk uh, in the earth in, in a pompous way. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَارٍ فَخُورٍ Allah does not like uh, everyone conceited and boastful. Mm. It's very beautiful beautiful yeah. reminder yeah. you're absolutely right now uh, of course our prophet sallallahu wasallam has also reminded us and told us how important it is um, to be humble so in one hadith he says tawadu hatta la yafkharu ahadun ala ahad allah has revealed to me uh, that we don't know in what form um, at times it's mentioned as being Hadith Qudsi, difficult to tell, but it's a form of revelation, of course it's not Qur'an, that you should be humble so that one should neither hold himself above, uh, above another nor transgress against another. And looking at the wording here, uh, Paul, and what we've, we've just been uh, discussing, there's really very clear kind of uh, close connection between pride and aggression. Mm. And they always often pride that sense of self-image and self-promoting 
can always result in aggressive behavior. I will later actually get more into this subject. Uh, but you're absolutely right that pride uh, can, can cause that. And um, this is another hadith. Both of these come from Muslim, uh, as you see. Wealth is not diminished by giving charity. Very beautiful. Allah augments the honor of one who forgives and one who displays humbleness towards another seeking the pleasure of Allah. Allah exalts him in ranks. Um, the word in Arabic, وَمَا تَوَاضَعَ أَحَدٌ لِلَّهِ إِلَّا رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ Now, obviously, uh, in the same way that um, the Qur'an calls uh, for humility, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, it also condemns pride. Pride in the Qur'an, the word for pride is kibr, kibr. And then as a root is uh, related to things like kabir, large, big. So oh, but that's, yeah, yeah, that's the word, uh, kibr. And kibr is unconditionally condemned in the Qur'an. So at times you have certain terms that may depend on the context, the meaning of which depends on the context, uh, not the case uh, with this particular term. And uh, it's not only uh, the Quran, but the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu This is a very famous uh, hadith where he says, he who, ha who has in his heart the weight of an atom of pride shall not enter paradise. لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال ذرة من كبر In the same hadith, and this is really quite... <coughs> Uh, well-known hadith, but probably less known, I think, and less quoted, the second half uh, of this hadith. Because in that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ goes on to give us what we can consider as a definition uh, of uh, pride, of kibbun. So what does he say? He says, denying the truth. And he says, which is in Arabic, بطر الحق. Denying the truth. And then the second part is having contempt for people. And what's important really about this definition is that it covers the two domains in which pr pride, poor behavior, uh, basically manifests itself. One of, one of them is when we deal with concepts with facts, with the truth, with ideas, mm. abstract things. And the other, when we treat people, when we, how we treat somebody we know, or we don't know. So the definition of pride or the impact of pride has implications for both of these. And the, the, the important thing also to highlight here is that unlike other kind of a kind of poor uh, qualities like ignorance the pride is specifically something that's driven by one's ego or what we call in islam nafs it's ego driven ego promoting ego ego protecting behavior and that's what makes it different from uh, the word uh, jahl for instance there are people who would disagree and they would say um, I don't agree that Islam is the, you know, Muhammad is a real messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of those would basically be saying that because of their lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's what you may call ignorance. Just they are ignorant of what they're talking about. But there are others who, and that's kiba, those who go out of their way and insist on denying the Prophet prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even if on balance, on balance, they should accept it. Mm, mm. So looking at the arguments, balancing the arguments, they should accept it. That is a driven, not in this case, by ignorance. So not knowing facts, not studying history, not studying scripture. No, it's purely because it's something to do with their ego, something to do. There's something about them. And as a side point, uh, something uh, it's, I didn't put on the slide here. Um, I mentioned that kibr is condemned unconditionally, and so 
is the adjective mutakabbir. Mutakabbir uh, is the person who has kibr. However, the word al-mutakabbir, al-mutakabbir, there is one of the beautiful names, attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are certain, and this is kind of a side subject I thought I might mention, it is really um, an important thing to uh, realize. There are certain concepts that apply to the creator and they are positive. But if a creator, a, a, a creature would uh, uh, kind of claim them, they become bad. Another example, Al-Jabbar. Al-Jabbar means it's usually translated as the tyrant, a tyrant. So mm -hmm. a tyrant is when you, the term itself has negative connotations because somebody was trying to control everything. However, it's not the case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is his description. That's what he is. Mm -hmm. He does whatever he wants. He has control over everything. So it's not a negative in his, in his case, which is why Al-Jabbar is one of his beautiful names. But if you call somebody Jabbar, you're actually accusing them of a transgression effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously there are certain names that are shared. So when you look at the name Rahman, uh, Rahim, for instance, merciful. Merciful can be used by a human being, by a creature. And of course, it's Al-Rahman in the definite article. Uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Going back to the slides. Mm. Now, pride, I spoke about pride in general. Um, what I thought would be useful is to try and kind of differentiate between two kinds of pride. One I called personal pride. So what is personal pride? Personal pride is something, and I'll get to the second one. Second one is group pride. And uh, personal pride is, is concern, concerns our self-image, the how we perceive uh, our ourselves and our status. And what the pride does is to give superiority, supremacy, priority to that self-image, to whatever I think of myself. So when I face a, a person talking to me about something, or a situation, or a concept, my reference point is my ego, my self-image, my, my personal status as I perceive it. And I make that my main concern. And I'm calling this personal pride. And to give an example of that, we put in the Quran, Pharaoh, for instance. Mm. I am your supreme Lord. Okay. So, He's talking about himself. He's not talking about the group. He's not that. He thinks he's different from everybody else. And it's this kind of personal status that he has for himself. Uh, that is an, an element of, uh, uh, sorry, an example of pride. Uh, another example that the Quran gives us is um, of somebody who was um, um, at the time of Moses. And it's called uh, Qarun. Qarun or Sorry, uh, I think I'm, I've gone the wrong direction. Yes, um, Korah. Um, and Korah was a very rich man. And he had a lot of people advising him that he would share with, she should share with others, etc. And, and do charity. His reply was, إِنَّمَا أُوْتِيتُهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عندي. I was only given it because of knowledge I have. Now, look at how Look at the contrast between these statements and the prayer of Joseph mm, mm, or, yeah. or Solomon or mm. the Prophet ﷺ, should I not be a grateful uh, servant? And, and the difference between them just could not be clear. Mm. Yeah. There are a number of, I think we don't need, I think, the slides now, Paul. Uh, if we switch them off. Yes, thank you. And uh, now there are a number, of obviously, obvious problems with the with the pride, which what I'm calling here personal pride. Uh, the first of all, what I'm calling self ignorance. Self ignorance is when we overestimate ourselves. Mm. We overestimate what we know, um, and and that often is combined with ignorance of the others. So what I call other ignorance. 
which is basically underestimating the others. So it's a combination of these two. On the one hand, I'm pompous, I have this inflated image, image of myself. And then there's somebody else who's not me talking to me about something that we happen to disagree on. And what I tend to do is to try and find a way of positioning myself as better than them, higher than them, underestimate what they are about. What is driving me here, the way I describe it, of course, is my pride. Mm -hmm. It's not any intellectual engagement. I'm mm -hmm. not listening to them, they're not listening. I think probably you've come across this expression before. People are having a discussion, uh, talking to each other, but they are re in reality, they are not. They are lecturing each other. Oh, yeah. Somebody is listening, uh, the expression is, you're just waiting to speak. So you're not even listening. This, this, this is, this is uh, the, in my experience, maybe it's not typical, but in my experience, this is the norm. This is not some kind of aberration. Uh, there are people posturing uh, and verbally saying that they are, are asking for information or making a point, but there's no actual listening ever going on. And it's, it's, it's posturing, it's uh, trying to win one over, but there's no um, sincere search for truth. There's no sincere attempt also to find common ground there's no sincere attempt to um uh, reach uh, a, a reality beyond our own egos it, it, it is a performance uh, and it's totally ego driven and and that is the norm actually <laughs> and in places like speaker's corner i think it's made worse I, I, i'm not saying people are morally to blame me necessarily it's made much more difficult and challenging to be sincere uh, because of the presence of cameras, people with their iPhones, people filming, uh, the filming for YouTube that usually, uh, and also for Facebook and other platforms. And so, you know, you know, you're on, you're, you're performing for the camera and money's involved because a lot of these channels are monetized. So it's, uh, and this is never spoken. This is never said publicly, but I know it's true. Uh, money is uh, a uh, part of the factor uh, and the desire to not uh, look bad or be humiliated or to lose, to lose the art, to lose the argument. And, you know, all of these characteristics, I, I, I'm, I've, uh, I'm not in any way superior to what's going on, that I have had my fair, own fa fair or unfair share of these faults. Uh, I must stress that. But nevertheless, this is the norm. And, and the, the best conversations, the best dower, the best... Uh, it, it, um, you know, interpersonal communication, in my experience, happens away from the cameras when you just got one on one person. So you're talking to Mr. Fred, Mr. Fred Jones, whatever, and you're just having a sincere heart to heart. And, and there's none of this posturing and ego uh, going on. If you bring in cameras, you bring in crowds, other people watching, um, then suddenly it all goes very pear shaped. And I would say that's true 95% of the time. It's shockingly normal. Um, and you get that too when you see ar arguments on Twitter, mm -hmm. on Facebook, uh, on other platforms. You, you, you know, the ego comes up and it's very hard to resist it. Uh, and, and so, you know, the, the teaching you're highlighting and sharing is extremely uh, pertinent and relevant and timely, I think, particularly with these. Um, clashes and conflicts we're seeing between prominent dower carriers online at the moment there's without mentioning any names <laughs> um there's a lot of it going on uh, and it's still going on uh, and a lot of these people are very talented people with a lot of knowledge they're not in any way fools but they, they are falling into this trap of um the ego uh, in the way that you're describing i think and i, I do stress I, I i'm the first to say that all of this advice applies to me because I, I i've certainly fallen short massively uh, over the years this is such an important point, Paul, um, not only in terms of we're talking face to face, um, you know, discussions, uh, but also uh, because of social media is an extension, obviously, of the physical world. And that, that happens uh, there all the time. Yes. And I personally, I never really engage in one to one debate. The moment the word debate is mentioned, I'm off. <laughs> for two reasons. First of all, I'm 61 years old. I know myself very well. I don't trust myself. That's one. What I mean by that, I'm not probably better than a lot of people at controlling myself and managing my thinking process and what's going on. But I know that I can at times also fall, fall victim to the moment and what's going on in that particular instance, whether it's a particular way of arguing, uh, posturing, 
potentially insulting, etc. All of that can really can muddle the whole thing. Oh, yeah. The other thing I would say is again from personal experience, but that applies really to most people, who, whether they are scholars or in just you know like learning and reading. I remember when uh, when we did a <laughs> program on abrogation, I got quite a bit of abuse. Uh, on the back of that abuse, I would say people were angry. Why you say? Because a lot of Muslims say abrogation is, and I didn't deny abrogation, of course. I was talking about certain particular journal of, of hadith, and I'm not a hadith denier, but then it started coming from everywhere. And I looked at some of what's going on there, and I remember, I don't engage with them, but there was a couple of threads where I felt there was some substantive arguments. So basically certain points, I thought, I'm going to mention them and leave them there. And I remember telling somebody that learning how the, the thread was developing is becoming, and I told them learning happens in quietness and solitude. Hmm. That's where I learned. I never learned anything sitting in the middle of a fuss hmm. and um, a group of males, everybody's trying to prove that they can shout louder than the other. Mm. I never learned in that, absolutely, and will never learn. And, you know, I know social media, of course, is an important communication method. And without social media, we wouldn't have been doing this, Paul, of course. But it just really comes with so much risk. And yeah. I'm pretty sure Absolutely. you've become such a skilled person at managing it after a long period. It's difficult, I understand. Uh, but And that's why you hear all kinds of horror stories every now and then about what goes on. On social media but you're yeah. you're right and um, i think what what the point we're talking about here is what we refer to as self-awareness how much you know yourself what do you know about yourself what works for you what doesn't work for you i'm pretty sure there are people who can sit and have a reasonable discussion and everything is all right and there are people who are less capable of doing that for mm. whatever reason and they will rather not do it but um, i have kind of serious doubts about anybody going into stage debate and claiming that they are open-minded to change their opinion. I really, really doubt that. They're yeah. there for whatever reason, probably they to broadcast their own views, which is nothing wrong with that, but just don't claim that you're doing it for some other reasons. Very difficult. Okay. Um, can we then go back to the yes, thank yep. you. Okay. So, as I mentioned, um, it's self-awareness, self-observation is really a must-have in, in what we're talking about here. And um, by just looking at yourself, your reactions, why did I say what I said, why, etc., we become more kind of, we learn about ourselves more. Uh, we know what our weaknesses are, how to avoid them, how to reduce them, what situations can set us off and all that that kind of thing and this is important because that's that's some of the one of the strategies to avoid behaving in a proud way and exercise our pride and also it's a way of reducing that pride the less we use it uh, the faster it goes away and the faster it disappears moving on to the next uh kind of pride and that I think, okay, uh, I obviously haven't put the order correctly here, but it doesn't matter. So this is what I'm calling group of pride. Group of pride is when we claim a perceived status of, of a group we have decided to belong to. So mm -hmm. let, me, let me just kind of put it in more explicit terms. Um, a Sufi, we claim whatever comes with Sufism, good things, of course. We never kind of claim anything that's not good. Uh, a Salafi would do the same. A Shia would claim anything good they think is good about Shiaism. Uh, the same a Sunni would do the same, which is which is which is fine in a principle to an extent. But let me explain uh, the problem here. The main problem is that if I say I am so-and-so, I am making a claim. I am making a claim. I am not giving evidence that I represent so-and-so. So if I say, 
I'm a Sufi. I'm not really saying that I represent the best that's there in Sufism and I'm etc. I'm not saying that because that's only a claim that I have made. And that applies to the bigger term, the bigger term being Muslim. And that's why somebody like Joseph was praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what a wafani Muslim caused me to die as a Muslim. He couldn't even claim that he would continue to be a Muslim or at, at the time of his death, he will be a Muslim. That mm. is in my, um, um, my kind of thinking is really very important to realize. A lot of people behave on that basis. So they attack the other, not because they have acquired the skills, the knowledge, etc., of the group they claim to belong to. So they are talking out of that, if you like, a credit they have. No, it's only a claim. I represent this group. He or she from that group, I am better than him because I belong to that group. He, she belongs to the other group. And I give two examples here of what I am calling group pride. So look at Satan, Shaitan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him and the angels to prostrate themselves to Adam. And look at what he said, I am better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. And khayrun minu. Now, he didn't know much about Adam. Adam had not been created yet. Mm. He couldn't speak about him individually. All he could do is to look at what I call a group because he belonged to those who are created from fire. And as it, on the basis of that, he made an individual judgment, mm. a judgment about an individual. And that individual wasn't even properly known to him mm. yet. And Malaika, who are said to have been to have been created from light, prostrated themselves to Adam. They didn't have that pride. And of course, that pride of Satan is ultimately what led him to his what led to his fall, of course. Another example I quote from uh, Joseph's brother story, and they were arguing about why Jacob preferred and loved Joseph and his brother more than them. And his argument was, Joseph and his brothers are more beloved to our father than we, while we are a group. <inaudible> our father is in a great delusion. So just on the basis of being group, or at times it's Osba, they, some people uh, translated as band. So because they were kind of 10, there are 10 of them, they were older, stronger, all of mm -hmm. that. So looking at this group and making again an, a judgment about an individual, as if they thought Allah subhanahu um, Jacob was making the same mistake, which was, of course he wasn't. Now, if we probably stop the yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And now, if you look at the prayer, uh, Joseph's uh, prayer, he avoided both of these forms of pride. On the one hand, he asked to die as a Muslim. So he didn't claim that he was a Muslim as an individual. Mm. And the other, he wanted to be joined with the righteous, Salihin. He didn't claim to be a member of that group. So he avoided both forms of pride as opposed to what we see here. Now, as I mentioned, a um, group of pride is, is really more of a category error, if you like, because what, what's happening here, we're mistaking a claim for a proof. So I want, I belong to a group, and then as a result, I present myself as a representative of that group and as a result, my group being better than other group, I am better than everybody in that group. To simplify uh, the argument, Obvio obviously, because we're human beings and we are very complicated and very clever, intelligent, we don't put it in this blatant way. We really go about it in very sophisticated matter, but that's ultimately what boils down to. Uh, my group is better than a group. I and all those people are better than you and all of you folks. We're better than you all. The, Belonging to a group also is, is 
to say I am a Sunni, so a lot of people say, and I'm an Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah, you have every right to say that. But you really have to meet the requirements of that. You have to understand what that means. It's not sufficient to put yourself in opposition to Shia, for instance, and say, so, well, because of that, I am this. You have to live up. You have to understand what that means. You also, and that's very important, merits in Islam are as for individuals, not for groups. Really, really important point. Mm. There is nothing about a particular group of people that are looked at in Islam and the Quran and anywhere and say, this group is better. You become a member of a group because you behaved in a particular way. So a group is an outcome. It's not a starting point. It's an outcome. It's by, by your own deed, by your own action, you become one of the righteous, one of the salihin. You don't become a salihin because, oh, I've decided to apply and get membership of this group. That's not how it works, obviously. So uh, you, you it's, it's individual. Now, somebody might say, but there's the concept of ummah. Concept of ummah we are all familiar with, nation. Of course, that concept exists. But if you look at its definition in the Quran, it mentioned more than once, it's an ummah, it's a group of people who met certain conditions. And as a result of sharing those values, they are referred to as an ummah. This is why the concept of ummah can also, in the eyes of many scholars, extend across centuries. It's not even one group, one time. You can call them one ummah. Mm -hmm. the, Rusul, the Rusul, the the, the prophets, the messengers are ummah wahida, one nation. How come? They lived in different places uh, because they shared the same values. They shared the same faith. They lived in the same way. So if you look at one verse uh, I've got here, I don't think I have it on, on slide. Sorry, Paul. I, I think it's it's only here in my notes. Well, this is a verse known to most people. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Ta'amuna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna al munka wa tu'minu billah. You are the best nation produced for mankind. You enjoin what's right and forbid what's wrong and believe in Allah. Now look at the definition. So the ummah is defined in terms of those values. So if somebody does not meet those conditions, it doesn't matter. They claim they are part of the ummah. They are not. Not in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not. Another ayah. وَلِتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَاكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ and let there be from you a nation inviting to good, enjoining what's right and forbidding what's wrong. And those will be the successful. Again, the definition of ummah here. And like I say, it's something that extends across centuries and across actually, um, you know, different eras. Now, obviously, somebody might argue, say, well, yeah, but, but there is the concept of still um, groups can come in the form of societal structures. So there are societal groups. So, of course, um, we as a Muslim, we may be very different. But when it comes to Islamophobia, we are one group. We are treated as one group. We suffer together. And um, uh, that, so that's, that's real. That exists. So I'm not saying this concept does not exist. But don't conflate it. Don't conflate it with your status in the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we cannot say because I'm a Muslim, all Muslims are, you know, represent Islam, etc. We can't do that. And because merit is given to individuals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear in the Quran that when we go, when we are resurrected, we are resurrected as individuals, treated as individuals, and he says, for instance, وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدًا Fard means alone or individual. All of them will come to him on the day of resurrection alone. In another ayah, وَلَقَدْ جِئْتُمُونَ فُرَادَ كَمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ You have certainly come to us alone as we created you the first time. So we are created individually and we go back to him as individuals. Um, if we can go back to the slides, please, Paul. Thank you. Now, I want to talk um, a little about um, what I'm calling pride-driven uh, driven aggression, uh, we, which we spoke about. 
uh, earlier because as I mentioned, pride is one source and well known really and very kind of um, major source of aggression in all of its forms, including violence. Um, let me mention first a particular hadith. I don't know that I have it here or not. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. I've got the ayah here. Now, the background first uh, of this ayah. So, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, was told about an incident that happened whereby a group of Muslims, this is due in Medina, so the Muslims were at war. Um, and they they were sitting, a group of, of them, and a, a man went past them and he saluted them in peace. Uh, they jumped at him, killed him, and took his uh, sheep. He was a shepherd took his sheep. That was conveyed to the Prophet ﷺ, and this is what they say in the Al-Asbab al nizul the causes of revelation. They say this verse was revealed as a result of this incident. And I um, consider, I wrote about it in some detail in my book on Jihad, and I consider it, um, again, kind of underquoted, but it is extremely powerful and I'm going to go through it in, in a little bit of detail here to see what was telling us. Uh, the, obviously, this is the only, the first part of it. So it's addressing uh, all you who believe when you go forth in the cause of Allah, investigate, clarify, make sure you know what's happening. Do not say to one who offer you peace, you are not a believer. Why would they do that? Because you seek the goods of this world, for with Allah are many spoils. Being at war, if they accuse somebody of not being somebody who's at peace or willing to have peace with them, any group of Muslims can then claim that um, they, are, they were afraid that this person might kill them, they are at war with them, they kill the man or whoever they happen to be, and then take their possessions as spoils of war. That is clearly, explicitly, directly rejected. It's wrong. And then it goes on, and this is really what makes the, the, the ayah is even more powerful. You were too like them before. Then Allah comfort comfort his favor upon you so investigate so he's telling the mu'mineen you were like them you did not believe in islam you were uh, people who believed in many other gods had i not given you the time had i not been patient with you you would have been killed i would have sent somebody to kill you in other words if that logic is accepted most of the sahaba we wouldn't have heard of yeah yeah that's basically what it is. But what's interesting as well is that it's actually talking about somebody who's not a Muslim. It just says peace. Yeah. He said peace. I'm at peace with you. You're at war, not with me. You have no right. The other thing here, Paul, and that's really where it gets quite kind of, um, it shows the, the flaws in this logic. They could tell at that point in time that this person, for instance, wasn't a Muslim. Let's say they knew that he wasn't a Muslim. But how do you know that he will never become a Muslim? Mm -hmm. Who gave you this knowledge, this certainty, this the ability to make this judgment? You can't. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, I think if we leave this slide, Paul, probably just to focus on, yeah. And, and there are also, in hadith, um, similar uh, incidents. So one, in one inst incident, the Prophet had sent Usama bin Zayd. Um, Zayd is the uh, companion who's mentioned in the Quran. So th this is his son. He sent him um, uh, for a battle, a raid, um, uh, to a certain place. And in the, while they were fighting, 
uh, somebody tried to run away, they ran after him, and he turned and he said, La ilaha illallah. Mm. And Usama killed him. Yeah. They came back to the Prophet, Sallam, they told him what happened. And he said, I killed him. After he said, so the Prophet Sallam looked at him and said, Did you kill him after he said, La ilaha illallah? And he said, Yeah. Uh, he just uh, did it out of fear and he repeated it three times did you kill him after he said la ilaha illallah and he said the same and then he went on and said did you open up his heart to see whether he said it from his heart or not and that was the point about why you can't we, we at often a very common mistake we make is to conflate a person an idea, their present and their future. Conflate, conflate all these together and make them one thing in one moment of time that deserves a judgment there and then. And that that's wrong. We can even say, I know somebody who's, a, let's say, an Islamophobe, for instance, somebody. Well, I can't talk about him today, now, right? Well, Omar, the great companion, was an Islamophobe, if you like, at some point, right? Yeah. He, he was against Islam, uh, but look what where, where he went, where you know how how far he came and and what happened to him. So I can talk about somebody, and now that's possible, and say somebody is an anti-Islam. Is a, but I can't say that he will or she will always be like that. That's where do I get this from? That's 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 just going well beyond what I can as a human being say. And. Um, The other thing is, and I, this is again, I'm pretty sure you, um, from your personal experience, you, you have something similar to say. We have, we disagree with a lot of people and um, disagreement doesn't mean that those people become useless and they are of no use to us. I personally read quite a bit in the areas I'm interested in, uh, often things to do with research I'm doing or something I'm writing. But I often find myself reading more for people I disagree with than people I agree with. I learn more from these people than from the people I agree with. Because these are the people who are challenging what I think is the truth, what I believe in. And these are the people that force me to then make a contribution, and a new contribution over and above what has already been made. They are very valuable. They are among my teachers. I learn from them. I may disagree with all kinds of things they say, but that's part. And they, and also in the course of them saying what they say and things that I, I dislike and at times really quite insulting, but you can still at times learn something useful in what they are saying there. And that distinction between somebody's you know, state of mind and belief in any point in time and the judgment we pass as if it's, you know, the final judgment on them is extremely important. We have to kind of dif differentiate uh, between these two. So uh, what I would say always is that we are required to engage, but not to judge and to differentiate between people and between concepts mm -hmm. and uh, all of these, nothing, if I am humble, if I were as humble as somebody like Joseph, somebody like the Prophet Sallallahu I won't be able to harm somebody out of my pr pr pride in myself. I can't do that. I can't, do, how can I know that he's not going to become better than me one day? What, what, where do I get the certainty from that this is not going to happen? So that humility, that also Again, we go to the original point uh, of referring everything to Allah, everything good we have to Allah would immediately deflate us, remove that sense of grandiose that we have about ourselves. And I would like to kind of finish here by starting with uh, where we came from. It's not on the slide, sorry, Paul. <laughs> Uh, where uh, where we started we spoke about the prayer that Sayyidina Yusuf uh, okay. uh, made at the end of the story and the last time we spoke about um, uh, the story here uh, of uh, Sayyidina Yusuf uh, I did speak about the forgiveness 
uh, of uh, Joseph, his forgiveness of his brother. But then you uh, really rightly pointed out yeah. how the Prophet yeah. did the same in, uh, in when he Mecca. Went yeah. to Mecca. Yeah. If you want to mention it again, Paul, in this context, I think for those who haven't heard, it would be really useful. Gosh, um, well, yes, uh, as as you as you say, um, off the top of my head, the, the Prophet Muhammad, upon the Hubi peace, uh, explicitly referenced uh, the uh, the life uh, and example of Joseph uh, in the Quran at that final point uh, when the Prophet went back to uh, Mecca in, in triumph. Really, um, he had defeated his enemies, and, um, and and one might have expected, perhaps if one didn't know the man. Um, that uh, he would have taken the opportunity to avenge his himself. Although some of his closest friends, family members, Hamza, of course, you know, others have been brutally uh, murdered actually by uh, his enemies. So this would have been a great time, of course, to take vengeance on his enemies. Uh, where at that moment of total power over a uh, whole of Arabia, so he went to finally entered into his hometown in Mecca at the end of his uh, end, end of the episode of his life. And um, taking explicitly referencing the example of Joseph, of course, as is the whole point, uh, where, uh, as you say, in, in, in that very chapter in the Quran, Joseph uh, forgives his family, his brothers, who had so wronged him, uh, his brothers who had sold him into slavery, left him in a well, had, had left him for dead. Um, he forgave them. And, um, and that's exactly what the prophet did, actually, in Mecca. Um, and so he he forgave from a position of power and strength rather than a position of weakness, and and this says something extraordinary about the man. One of the things that when I first encountered the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace as a, as a Christian actually, uh, just to completely bowled me over because I was used to being impressed by the life of Jesus in the Gospels, but to be equally impressed or, or to be honest more impressed because there's more information about Muhammad of course than there is about Jesus I think available to us today. Uh, just being incredibly impressed with uh, this this human being um, who, who could have so easily have um, taken vengeance on his enemies, but chose actually the path of forgiveness. Uh, and that takes a superlative level, almost a superhuman level of strength uh, and, and humility uh, as well uh, and wisdom, um, which is not given to many people on earth. Absolutely. I think if, I, if I'd been in that position, I'm not quite sure I would have behaved the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. He actually quoted, as you say, the exact uh, verse, فيكم, something along these lines, كما قال يوسف, uh, I'll say about you, as Yusuf said to his brothers, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. No blame uh, or no reproach is on you today. Uh, Allah يغفر لكم. God, Allah will forgive you or right. shall forgive you. So it's exactly that. And um, I think with this reference um, to the story of Joseph, again, uh, I I finish here, Paul. Okay, All right. Okay, so that, that's the last one. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed uh, for your, that's an extremely interesting presentation, I must say. I, I was, I've uh, been making notes throughout to look up verses and, uh, and tweet some of the things you've been saying actually absolutely fascinating um very rich um passage in the quran uh, and you brought out many of the contrasts as well between pride and humility very powerfully so i do thank you very much indeed for your uh, you. your scholarly thoroughness as well as the uh the, the, the humanity and wisdom which you you brought to this it's not just an academic issue far from it it's one of uh, that engages us in our hearts and in our lives and how we behave particularly how we behave towards other people. Do we behave well to them? Do we behave with pride and arrogance or with um, humility and humanity, put it that way. So um, very, very valuable indeed. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, well, until next time. Assalamu alaikum.